Well, I think I'm going to build on the last talk, uh, which showed you a little bit on you know how to get started with DBT, a little bit of the developer workflow and an improved developer workflow. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit about taking that part of DBT that was all to do with transformations and kind of taking it one step further um, to being all the way through to visualization and dashboard. So how can we keep this much better improved kind of transformation code-based workflow and do it more at the, at the BI layer? Um, so I've got a data stack as code or BI as code, but as code is the thing that you want to be thinking about uh, for the talk. Um, so who am I? I'm Oliver. Um, and I work at Lightdash, I'm the co-founder and CTO of Lightdash, uh, which is uh, a BI tool that integrates with DBT. So we've got one top of DBT, and it was a really good point that you made that DBT is a big community, it's a global community, uh, and we're a BI tool that was really built out of the community. So here's the team, we're actually a bit bigger than this now. Uh, this is an offsite we had in Essex in the UK. Um, and everyone's working really hard to build a kind of DBT native, developer-friendly uh, BI tool. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of curious that people work with BI, things like Tableau, Looker, Metabase, Superset. Hands on there if you develop in BI every day. Okay, nice. And I saw there's also the DBT users as well, so I think this is going to be really interesting. That's perfect, thank you so much. Sorry for punching over a glass of water. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I, I kind of wanted to share, I mean, lots has changed since I've been in data. I've worked in data in all sorts of formats. Um, from enterprise and kind of aircraft data, academia, in industry, and with kind of clickstream data and ad data. Um, so yeah, as long as it's there as numbers, I'm kind of interested. And not, I mean, a lot of stuff has changed in the ecosystem. Um, there's some things also kind of hasn't changed. And one thing that hasn't really changed too much is the, the developer workflow. And I think DBT was a big leap um, and really opened a lot of our eyes to how there could be a better developer workflow. Um, but I, I think what I want to share today is that we can, we've got a lot more, there's a lot more improvements on the table. And there's, I think there's a lot of things we can do. And so the subtitle of the talk is how to 10x your productivity. And I really believe that in a year or so, as an analyst, we will be 10 times more productive with some of the tools I'm going to share today. And a little of that is like Dash, our own tool, but um, there's also a ton of other things that I want to show you too. Um, so maybe let's start a little bit to, to how we got here, what's the background? How did we end up with DBT? And I mean, if you needed more proof, the last presentation was a great one of how DBT really helps you become more productive. So getting rid of those sort of procedures, treating transformations as code, and all of those good things. Um, so if you've been working this for a few years, you'll probably remember the, the kind of shift that happened to massively parallel processing. So before then, we were kind of like putting pressure on our application databases to run these analytical queries. Um, and AWS came along and, and launched Redshift, and of course there are proprietary versions of this at Google, what was to be BigQuery later. Um, but what it meant was, instead of having data engineers managing this complex engineering structure, <coughs> business analysts and data analysts were actually kind of able to manage the pipeline with SQL as transformations, and it got rid of a lot of the sort of procedures and the, and the complex data engineering that happened. And a bunch of these tools you know, came up, some paid for, some open source, there's a little mixture here, there are plenty of other options, I'm not uh, backing any of these specific ones, but um, right here in the middle is DBT, right? and this is kind of what the community has, ha ha has blossomed around, and the idea that data analysts can actually manage this entire pipeline um, with, a, with, a, with a little bit of software engineering knowledge. And I think I would argue that analysts have become more technical and also more enabled by these by these tools. So we're able to do more with less, but I think like a lot of roles, everyone is picking up some programming, everyone's learning a bit of version control, and DBT has been like a really nice ramp, and it's actually created a whole new role, analytics engineering, so it really had a massive impact on the data community. Um, so yeah, I mean, we talked a bit about this. Um, and I wanted to get a bit into like kind of like an analytics engineer. You've probably seen the meme before, um, but the whole idea is that there was this person in the middle who was able to kind of like manage the data engineering stack, but also knew some of the business context and was an analyst, was dangerous with SQL, a bit of Python, um, and a lot of data folks became more engineering kind of overnight. But I think the, the, the thing that I shared at the beginning is I just don't think that we have the tooling to support this workflow properly. And I think we're getting there. I think DBT really opened up um, kind of open up the doors to, 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 to where we could be. 
And I think as engineers, we feel like we have these powerful tools like DBT and ELT tools and RBI tools. And it kind of feels like we have these powerful components, but if you stick them together, you kind of have this sort of janky developer experience. And I want to talk about, I kind of want to show you exactly what this developer experience is like, and we saw a bit of this in the last presentation too. And I kind of want to uh, prove the case that I think the developer workflow is broken. Um, which parts I think are broken and, and some kind of inspiration from software development that could help us to, to fix it as well. Okay, so here's the idea. We're going to propose some changes to, to the DBT project. So I saw a lot of people working in DBT. This is probably your daily bread. This is the thing you do every day. And it's maybe you want to add a new field to your BI tool. You have a dashboard and needs a new column in it. Or perhaps you need a whole new model so you've integrated a new data source. And you need to build a new model in DBT, expose it in your visual layer, and kind of you know pass an analysis to, to, to the end user. So I think this is what a lot of us are doing every day. So what do you do? I mean, we saw a live demo. This couldn't have been better. I've done it with a flowchart, but <laughs> we, we got a live demo earlier. So you go into VS Code, for example, and you go and add a new model. You take an old stored procedure or something and turn it into a, a, into a DBT model. Um, and you add some, some columns. And then what you might do, I've, this could be any SQL client, I put the BigQuery UI, if there's any GCP users here. Um, but then what you do is you jump to a SQL console, because without a doubt, the first time you run it, you got an error, right? I think when you write some SQL from scratch and hit enter, and it just executes immediately and gives you the right answer, it's kind of a once in a lifetime situation. So uh, I think a lot of the time we run it, DBT tells us there's an error, and then we have to actually go into some kind of live SQL client in order to execute that query. And we saw an example of that earlier, you know, where we jumped from, from one to another to run the live query to see what happened. And more often than not, and you know what I'm talking about, if you do it with DBT, you go into that target directory to find the compiled SQL, you copy that, and you put it in your client, and you run it, and you kind of figure out what's wrong, and you fiddle with the code. And then when you think you've got it, and you fix the SQL, you go back into DBT, replace those table names with references, and you've kind of done this cycle where you've written some code, got the compiled version, copied it into a client, played it in a client, put it back. It's already starting to feel a little bit hairy. Um, then you go ahead and add some documentation and testing. It was really cool seeing the auto-generating function earlier. So it was generating the, those docs for you, so that's nice. <coughs> Write some tests, maybe some uniqueness tests on an ID value or, or a not null value. And you kind of go through this, uh, this, this, this cycle again of rewriting it and checking DBT. Okay, so it's all looking good. It's working locally, some tests, our tests have passed. And then we're gonna push it up uh, to our version control, um, wherever that is, and maybe we have some tests running there too. So we're gonna, we're gonna push it up and it's gonna run some checks. Um, everything looks good, the code's in production, we've updated our DBT model. Um, it works in staging, so you know, we've, we've tried it uh, maybe with a test date set or something like that, and now we need to run it in production. And for a lot of us, the production environment is different to your development environment, so maybe you're doing this in Airflow, maybe in Dagster, or maybe some a cron job running on a VM somewhere. It doesn't really matter, but somewhere there's a production kind of DBT run happening. And so that's going to get triggered, maybe you have to go and run it yourself. Um, and you can already see I've touched a lot of tools already, in trying to get this, this one field added to, for an analysis. And maybe in the meantime, while that's running, I'm going to jump into the BI layer, and I'm going to go and add that new field, maybe start thinking about what the chart would look like. Um, depending on the tool you have, that might be um, a simple change. If it's something more advanced, like Looker, you might have some modeling to do it in that layer too. Um, and then you build the chart, and lo and behold, by the time you get to building the actual thing in the dashboard, you spot an error. You know, okay, there's something wrong with this chart, and there's nothing like a chart to help you eyeball the underlying data. And it's usually quite obvious when something's gone wrong. This looks kind of suspicious here. I suspect this is a real chart. I don't know what the error was in this case. <laughs> um, and so what happens? You go all the way back to the model. But you have to go back to the model definition right at the start. So you're back in VS Code, you're iterating, committing, running a main job, updating the BI tool, and, and, and this was something that <laughs> you hope would take a, a few minutes, but actually ends up taking ages, especially depending on how much um, testing and, and what processes your team has around getting DBT code to production. 
For some people, it's like a, a YOLO merge, you just click and it goes. For other teams, there's like a big code review process that you've gone through in order to you know, find out that that's gonna fail. So maybe you go to the DBT memes channel at this point to kind of you know, get a bit of a, <laughs> a boost because you might really be feeling a bit low at this point that you've gotta go back and, and redo a bunch of this. Um, so like ideally, the biggest time sink, or that's not a time sink, but most development time, would be why you actually build the model. So building the business logic and updating your DBT model. But because of the way that the developer flow kind of works now, you end up spending so much time in the rest of this, figuring out the production runs, trying to debug, um, making sure that the, the, the charts work, and, and you find out so late when there's an error that you have to go all the way back to the start. Um, and so we call this a development spaghetti. Katie on our team, she spent a lot of time talking to data teams of various scales, and we interviewed them and asked them, how many tools are you using? What does your development process look like around DBT? And it was 90% of the time, they agreed that it would be called a spaghetti. They were using all these different tools, cobbled together, and the, this process was really uh, demotivating, you know, going around this loop over and over again. Um, so there's a bunch of problems that, that, that we kind of teased out of those interviews, but I wanted to focus on three, um, three main ones. So one of them is around having testing environments, having sandboxes to, to, to kind of test changes before they go to production. Um, the other one is around there just simply being too many tools. Uh, you have to, to get the context that you need, you have to switch to so many places. So is there a way we can reduce that? The third problem is things aren't kept in sync. So you saw you made a change in DBT, you had to push it to GitHub, and then the BI tool broke, it'd be nice to have these things more in sync. So what I want to do is take some inspiration from software engineering, which is, which is really where DBT started. It was about saying there's already an engineering workflow around code and around transformations, so let's build that into, into SQL. And so what I want to do is look at some software engineering tools, and I want to see how can we be inspired by those in our data, um, in, in kind of our data workflows. And um, I mean, data is sufficiently complex that we do deserve the kind of tools that software engineers has, but we simply don't right now. Um, but we need them because data is a really complex job, data pipelines are really complex, and we don't quite have the same kind of power of debugging that folks in JavaScript or Python might have. And so I want to use those as, as kind of a, a glimpse into the future of where I think data can be. Um, so the first one, has anyone used this is a, maybe a bit of an overlap. Has anyone used anything like Netlify? Are there people who are kind of front end engineers? Yeah, nice, I see hands, cool. Um, yeah, so this is a great, this is just one example of a tool you can use to deploy um, sort of front end, so JavaScript written applications. And what happens is when you open a pull request, it basically builds the whole application for you in a preview before you merge the code. Um, it's very impressive. So you can imagine you're running your, um, uh, your kind of e-commerce site where you're selling, I don't know, some nice trainers. Um, and you want to push something to production, you would never, these days, go directly onto the website, change the main code, and just like up refresh it. Um, you would propose a change through some kind of pull request, and then you would see a preview. You would try, like, what would this look like if we push it to production? And only then, when you're happy, you go ahead and do it. And so, what we did in, um, in LightDash, for example, is, and this is the most LightDash-specific one, <laughs> we built a, uh, Previews for data. So what happens in your DBT project, you basically make a change to the model. You type preview, just like you do in um, something like Netlify, and it will, it will basically build your whole kind of like BI layer. From, from scratch, in a sandbox, you can see what will actually happen to my charts and dashboards, and my queries if I made this change. For example, what would break? Would 10 charts break, would 100 charts break? Fingers crossed, no charts break. <laughs> but this allows you to do that without going straight to production. And so you can see we've kind of gone from this workflow, making a change in DBT, to getting it all the way to production, to finding out that it's broken, to this workflow, which is you, you can build a change and immediately see the effect on a chart without actually affecting your end users. And, um, and, and our goal is what I think we're gonna see as a community is this cycle get shorter and shorter and shorter, so that eventually it's almost live. So you make one line change here, hit save, and then you'll see the downstream impact of that. So then the second thing I want to talk a little bit about is this idea of having so much context. Um, this is an internal tool that uh, Katie built out with the team at Monzo at her previous job before she was at Lightdash. And um, 
the experience I want to say here is, is from a tool called Sentry. And so this is uh, a tool that a lot of um, applications use. And when it has an error, it gets all of the context. So it gets the, 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 the variables that were there at the time, the stack trace, uh, what exactly the user was doing that caused that error to start. And it puts it in one place, and it puts it in Slack. So for our team, we work in Slack, so putting that context there is really, really useful. Um, so like one potential solution for data would be much better context aggregation. So figuring out information about that airflow job, or why the, the VR layer is failing, or why a certain test is failing. And this is what this internal tool looks like. Um, I imagine soon somebody's going to start a company around something like this. <laughs> so you can expect it, or maybe there's somebody here who's going to kick this off. But yeah, the way this worked was, at the top here, it can tell you the model name of, of what's gone wrong. So DDT model failed in production. Um, and it had this really cool button here, and you would click this, and you would jump into a SQL client with a compiled SQL already. So you could just go ahead, you could hit enter, and you could see exactly why the, the test was failing. It tells you all about how that was executed. Uh, down here, it gives you the name of the test, and how many rows failed, and also, crucially, the person who made the most recent change. So this was actually Katie. Uh, she broke this. And so you can go to that person and say, hey, you're on the hook for, for fixing this test. So when we talk about better context aggregation, I would love to see something like this. Um, and I'm sure someone here has built a Slack bot, and I'd love to see you try and take some of that DBT stuff. And the cool thing about DBT being open source, and some of the community tools being open source, is that you, you can cobble this stuff together from what DBT gives you out of the box, which is really cool. And it's just another example of kind of going from checking all of these tools to actually having all the context you need uh, in one place. For us, that Slack, for you, that could be something totally different. And the last thing is all about keeping things in sync. Um, and so one thing that I think we're already getting more familiar with as a data community is CICD, or Continuous Integration and Continuous Delivery. And what that means is that you continually ship your code in small increments. And ideally, you make the lead time, we call this in software engineering, which is the time from proposing a change to getting it to production, we call that a lead time. And really productive software engineering teams get the lead time as small as possible, because the smaller your changes are, the less likely you are to break stuff on a big scale. Uh, and, and you feel momentum, because you're constantly shipping and, and, and updating things. Um, and so CircleCI is one example, GitHub Actions, Travis, you might have seen these kinds of tools. But the idea is that, that they will help automate a lot of the things that happen at the time that you change your DVT code. So you say, I want to change this DVT model this way, and after that, you don't want to think about uh, the rest of the process. It's all about making data folks' life easier. We call this DevOps in, in software engineering. And so we'd love to see much, even better CI/CD for data. We'd like to see much better automation through the whole stack, so that if you commit one thing to your repository, you would see everything trigger and update. You would see production update and things like that. This brings governance, because you can make sure that nobody can directly push to production, and it only happens on Rails. So people can't manually run this from the terminal, but it happens in a protected kind of delivery environment. Um, and it also brings just a lot of productivity and happiness for the team, because ideally what you want is for them to merge code, and then your contributors don't have to think anymore after that. And the whole idea is going back to the original problem. You want to be spending this like all of your brain power on those DBT transformations and the core business logic, and you don't want to worry about how those transformations eventually go to production, how the prod tables are updated, and how your BI is updated. Ideally, you'd have that all, all kind of happen on, happen on its own. Um, and so we, have I got a process? No, I haven't got too much of an example. What we do, what we do in uh, LightDash, for example, we cobbled together a GitHub action for this. And so what happens is when you merge the main, it updates the whole um, BI tool. And it gets rid of this problem of like having to actually, imagine you have a dashboard that maybe 100 people look at every single week. Right now, in most tools, the way that you do that is you directly go into that dashboard and you manipulate the, the, the dashboard live in production and you hit save. Maybe you broke it for everyone, hopefully you didn't. Um, and so what this allows you to do is to kind of have that to be more on Rails. So you can have an environment where you can do QA and you can maybe have a debate about whether this change is productive and then merge and it will automatically update the BI tool. Um, and one thing I was talking about at the beginning was having data as code. All of these use cases are powered by the fact that DBT gave us kind of like a code-based approach to writing our transformations um, by having the YAML files and the SQL files all together in kind of like an extensible 
way. So it produces a bunch of these JSON artifacts you can use to build your own use cases. Um, and we'd like to see more of the data stack, so more of the uh, ELT layer and more of the reverse ETL and more of the BI to also be as code, which would unlock these types of workflows. And when we talk about stuff as code, it's easy to say, like, oh, that's generally positive. Stuff as code is meant to be good. But I really believe that for data, it unlocks these real use cases like these ones, testing environments, uh, better kind of context aggregation, but also uh, CI, CD too. Um, okay, so what, what can we do about it? That's probably the question thing, and what, what can we do to move from here? I would encourage everyone here to stop thinking about data as kind of a linear process, as like you, you make a change, you go in and, and update another tool, and, and, consider, and kind of optimizing tools individually. It's very easy to look at DBT as a great solution for transformation, and, and your chosen ETL provider as a solution for ETL. But when you cobble them all together, you end up with a system that's not really efficient. And this will look really different for everyone's organizations. You know, each company has a different development process from, from another one and different business requirements. So I think we should start thinking a bit about, as a system that needs to be optimized, to think more about the developer workflow. And you know, in software engineering, they're a few years ahead of us in terms of this, and they've been thinking a lot about this. And I think there's a lot of analogs and a lot of problems that we have in data that were in software engineering a few years ago and have been solved through tooling, DevOps, and better development processes. And so hopefully, we end up getting kind of less of this kind of cobbled together machine to actually something that as a whole makes sense. And uh, in this case, it's a cheesy Ferrari <laughs> before we had this weird truck. I can't even tell if that's real or if it's like a Photoshop job, uh, but it's pretty disgusting. <laughs> so hopefully we can move more towards this kind of thing. And the way that I propose that we do that is to just kind of think about maybe within your team or within your organization, like if I want to propose a change or if I want to solve something for an end user, how many touch points are there? Like how many tools uh, um, uh, are the team using to make that change? Is it too many? How can we kind of collaborate better um, throughout the system? How can we kind of get context all in one place to figure out why things are going wrong? And um, how can we go much faster? And how can we ship and iterate? So ideally you want to minimize that lead time. Uh, I want to bring that idea to data. So from the moment that you know what change you need to make in DBT, how do you minimize the time it takes you to get those to the point of maybe building a chart or a dashboard or giving it to the end user, sometimes in a Google Sheet or an Excel document, that's perfectly fine. And it's at that point that you give it to the end stakeholder, they go, oh no, this revenue figure's way off, that can't be right. And you want to get to that point as fast as possible, and that's failing fast. And so I think all of these things that we can think about can help us optimize our own development systems around DBT and data. So yeah, that's the end of the talk. You can join the Lightdash community as well as the DBT community. We're very curious about data, about BI, and also development processes. So if this resonates with you, um, I'd love to chat afterwards too. Uh, so yeah, I'm happy to take any, any questions.